Uh, first off, so thanks for thanks for doing this, by the way, Bobby. Like, thanks for letting well, us come over. That's, I think this is about the only second one I've done here at the house, you know. Yeah, I appreciate it, though, and letting us come out and see the house. Oh. And I was sorry to hear about Sonny. Well, a lot of people were, and me especially, you know, me and him were, we traveled together 20 years. Yeah. He got, he's, he got kind of sick of the road and all that right there, and he just... He he quit probably close to twenty years yeah. ago. Yeah, he just got tired of it and packed out and left it. You know. Yeah. So uh, he wanted me to kind of quit with him, but I, I just couldn't see me. Uh, this is what I started with when I was fifteen years old. No, I ain't never quit. I ain't going to now. No, no, too late. Too late now. When the man calls me home, then I'll I'll give it up. Quit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Power. Welcome to Toy Heart, a podcast about bluegrass. Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for listening. Nice to be back in your podcast feed. Uh, I'll be honest with you, we were getting ready to start launching season two of the show after a long wait and a pandemic and all that. When word came out that two incredibly important voices in the history of bluegrass had passed on, seemingly one right after another. First was Jesse McReynolds of Jim and Jesse. You can hear our conversation with Jesse in our podcast feed. Uh, I feel so lucky to have spent that time with him. But then it was actually that day I was working at my day job at the CBC in Canada, and I was texting a friend who was working on a story for a show called As It Happens about Jesse McReynolds. And I said, well, there's kind of one voice left now from the earliest days of the music, and that's Bobby Osborne. And then like, I don't know, an hour later, News came through that Bobby had passed on himself. He was 91. Bobby, of course, was one half of the most legendary groups and influential groups in the history of the music. The Osborne brothers with his brother Sonny Osborne on the banjo. Bobby Osborne, incredible singer and mandolin player. And as you're going to hear, real pioneer of the music. So last summer, uh, when we were working on season two of Toy Heart, I got to spend some time with Bobby at his home outside of Nashville. And we talked, say, maybe for about an hour or so. And given Bobby's passing, I thought you should hear some of the stories that he told me about the early days of the music, about creating the harmonies that are still such a big part of the music, about his time serving in Korea, about electrifying bluegrass instruments, and of course, about Rocky Top. Bobby started out by talking to me about his early days growing up in rural Kentucky and his earliest memories of hearing country music. My, my dad, before we lived in Kentucky, is a little place called Thousand Sticks. Yeah. And uh, it's four million miles from Hyden, right out in the wilderness, you know. And that's where he was from, and the whole family of them was over in there, that part of, uh, of the county, you know. And um, I don't know. My dad, he was, he taught, he got, I don't know where he got his, well, he went to Brill, Brill College. Yeah. And my mom went, to, uh, she was at a little college up there somewhere where they got together. They were school teachers, right? Yeah. 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 He taught school over there in Thousand Sticks, this little old school. And I probably was five years old or something. He'd take me up there and I'd sit in them chairs like the rest of the kids did, you know. <laughs> and uh, as I don't know, just one thing led to another and. Finally grew up, and my granddad had a grocery store, and uh, all the, the boys, my dad and two more brothers, they kind of all just uh, fell in together and had worked, and they had a, my granddad had a sawmill going, and they kept everybody go to the woods and build up to get them trees and saw wood for people to build houses and stuff. And they went, I never seen a car till I was probably... 15 years old, 10 or between 10 and 15 years old. Yeah. Every once in a while, they, they built a road over through there, and you see somebody with a car, they, the, them old cars, was, they was that high off the ground, you know, so they, dirt road. Yeah. And if it wasn't raining or something, you might have seen a guy bring a car over in there, you know, but it was just, just up this way. And he had to have a good car to tore all the pieces. <laughs> but our, our way of traveling was riding a horse or a mule. Wow. That was the way you'd get it, yeah, or, yeah, or walk. So, so that was the way you'd hear music, I guess. You'd listen to the Opry in the nighttime. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. All, my, my, all my people, everybody, well, they wouldn't anything else to listen. When, when it got dark on Saturday night, they wouldn't have what you could do. You, you nobody wants to get out in a country like that where there's nothing but rattlesnakes and bullfrogs mm -hmm. or whatever. And so the Grand Ole Opry was a, 
they had it piped into every house. If you had a radio in the mountains or anywhere, you could, you could get the opera. And I just, that's what I, I listened to the Grand Ole Opera ever. So if you're a fan of this music even a little bit, you'll know that Bobby Osborne has one of the finest voices in the history of bluegrass. You'll remember moments when his voice was just so high, it was so powerful. It felt like it was just soaring, moments like this. I feel like so many bluegrass musicians and singers these days kind of want to sound like Bobby Osborne. But Bobby told me, you know, when he first started singing, his voice wasn't always like that. Of course, I listened to Monroe because my voice, all of a sudden, I was singing like Ernest Tubb, you know. Yeah. And one day I was trying to sing his songs and couldn't sing them no more. Your voice changed the other way. Your yeah. voice went got higher. Yeah. I yeah. Just, and I thought, and I couldn't, I couldn't sing like that no more. <laughs> Man, I was killed over that. I yeah. just wanted to. I loved Ernest Tubb. Yeah. Got to go see him when I was just a kid. Yeah. I'm walking the floor over you. I can't sleep a wink, that is true. I'm hoping. And I didn't know what happened. I mean, I just, you know, all of a sudden it just couldn't sing it in his keys and everything. But you could sing like Bill Monroe. You could sing that well, high. Yeah, well, yeah, I was all of a sudden just one day I couldn't sing Ernest songs anymore. And I'd, Try them in a higher key, and the higher I got them, where I could sing them. I thought well, I don't sound like Ernest Dub, but I just they wasn't no else, no way else to sing. Okay, so in this part, uh, again, the Osborne brothers are part of the foundations of bluegrass music, like the first people to hear the music and want to take it on. But in the early days, it's always so amazing to me how many of these early musicians played with one another, how close we were to it being like a whole other story. Like Carter Stanley from the Stanley Brothers played with Bill Monroe. Of course, you know, Jimmy Martin did as well. I had heard this story that Bobby played with the Stanley Brothers as well. So I asked him about it, and it actually turned into a bit of a story about how he got together with Jimmy Martin, too. Take a listen. So, so when you played with Carter and Ralph, what was that like? Because it's an interesting story, right? Because not only are the Osborne brothers one of the formative bands of bluegrass music, one of the form, you know, one of the, the core original bands of bluegrass music, and I, I want in a second I want to talk about Sonny and Bill Monroe, okay, uh, and and you guys and Jimmy Martin. Okay. But when you were with Carter and Ralph, well, it wasn't for very long. You were subbing in for Pee Wee, I guess. Well, Ralph had a car wreck. Oh. He he uh, he had a car wreck and was, I don't know, he was laid up pretty good for a period of time. And uh, while he was in the hospital recovering, Carter didn't have anything else to do. And somehow or another, they always thought Bill Monroe hung the moon anyway. And uh, and they were they were uh, on a station in Bristol, Tennessee. Yeah. WCYV. And... Uh, Ralph was, he, it took him maybe months to get over that car wreck. Well, Carter, he, I, he just kind of, no, he went to work with Bill Monroe. Yeah, he, they recorded uh, Get Down on she Your Knees and Pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You better get down on your knees and pray. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down, get down on your knees and pray. Yeah. I had never met them at the time, I don't believe. But Carter did that while Ralph was uh, recuperating. Mm-hmm. Vermont Ralph could sing and play again mm-hmm. while they, and they were on WCYB mm-hmm. Bristol in, before that. So, did you did you like playing with them? Was that? Oh, you? I loved it, yeah. yeah. It just about kind of, and for Pee Wee Lambert left, I just took his spot. Yeah. Because I'm getting, I can sing that third part where, where uh, that trio, they had, they had that trio again. Yeah. When I was with him. Yeah. And so uh, when Ralph got over his accident, but before that, Jimmy Martin came into the picture, you know. And so Jimmy Martin uh, talked me into me and him starting a group. And he had some contacts, contacts around Cincinnati, which led to and me and him got to go over to Cincinnati and, and record them four songs that we did. Yeah. On King Records. Yeah. And... Uh, we took Curly Ray Klein with us and his brother Charlie and got a bass player up there in, uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, so I, I met, Bill Monroe came to Bluefield, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I went down there to the State Theater. I went down there and the radio station where we was on 
was right, oh, it was just in a block of our house, and the, the State Theater where Monroe was going to play that night. Well, he had Jimmy Martin, Rudy Lyles, and uh, I don't know if it's Vassar Clemens or not. But yeah, it might have been Vassar, yeah. Could, it could yeah. have been. And, uh, Bessie was playing a bass. Bessie Lee Marlin, yeah. They played at the, the theater there, and I went down there and seen them that night. And I met Jimmy Martin. The reason I did meet him was uh, we just lived right around the block from the radio station. Mm -hmm. And I was up there. Uh, no, Larry and me went, and of course, Larry Bishop and me went there together. And um, I went up to that radio station. And, well, both of us went up that radio station, and they got there early. Yeah. Jimmy Martin and um, Rudy Lyles was with him. He hadn't come up there, but Jimmy Martin and Vassar, I believe, if that was a field player. And we went up there just sitting around, and Jimmy broke a second guitar string, and he didn't have no strings. And I went back to the house and got him a, a second guitar string. Yeah. Got acquainted with him like that. And Monroe come up there, and he had his band on, and they all gathered around. They did, we only had a little 10 minute show. Yeah. It was sponsored by a, a grocery store right across the yeah. street. Yeah. <laughs> so. Bill Monroe, he just did a one of them. Never played the band, and I, I wondered what he had in his hands. Yeah, but he never, he just held it, never touched it. And uh, he, he, they sang a gospel song to advertise his show that night. Yeah. So, and Jimmy didn't have that string. I went around the corner and got him a second guitar string, mm -hmm. and I got acquainted with him like that. Well, mm -hmm. when when Larry Bishop left, we didn't have no banjo player. Yeah. So uh, I thought about. Uh, I thought I, or another a guy to sing with me. Larry and me sing together this yeah. all the time. So I thought about Jimmy Martin. I said, and he might come up here. Yeah. I said, he, he's a good singer. Just a, a quick aside here. I love a Jimmy Martin story. So I was happy when Bobby said this. Well, when Jimmy Martin came up there, he played the guitar. Or he wouldn't play the guitar. He, he called me sport all the time. And I didn't, I never did like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> I finally told him one day, I said, if you call me sport again, you won't have to whip me. I don't want, I'm, I'm not a sport. <laughs> My name is Bobby, and that's sport. So, <laughs> that got that out of the way, but anyway. Uh, yeah, don't, don't call him sport. Oh, chalk up another one, another broken heart. Chalk up another one, a heart you tore apart. You pick me for... Okay, so up until now, we're talking about the early days of Bobby's music, but... Around the room we were in were sort of artifacts of his time in country music and bluegrass, but also some stuff that told you about the other parts of Bobby's life. Especially, like, after he starts playing music, but before the success of the Osborne brothers, Bobby served in the Marines in Korea during the Korean conflict. He did two years of service with the Marines, and he was wounded in combat and earned the Purple Heart. I was really grateful that Bobby shared the story, but I, I want to give you a heads up. It is about his time in the war and about his time being wounded. Um, take a listen. You were in the Marine Corps in Korea, right? right? Uh -huh. Yeah. I heard you tell a story one time that you, you got wounded. Yeah. And you said if it hadn't have been so cold, you would have, you, you could have died. That's true. When the thing broke out in Korea, and when I was working with Stanley Brothers, when yeah. that happened there, and I only worked with him th about three months, I got my call to go to the service. So I, I left Bluefield, I left Bristol, and all. I went home and yeah. had two weeks before I had to go and be sworn in as, as a Marine. Yeah. Had to go to Cincinnati. And uh, <laughs> my my mom's had five brothers in the Army. Mm -hmm. And they'd heard that the Marine Corps was just a rough outfit and everything, you know. And every one of them says, whatever, when they knew I was going to go be, have to go to the, to be a, Checked in where I wanted the Army to bring Corps. Yeah. But so I went to Cincinnati to do that. So the guy had, I don't know, they had about 50 or 60 guys in this room was all going together, signed, in, signed up for the Marine Corps. No, it was just going to sign up for the military duty. That's what it was. Yeah. So, and I heard all my uncles, five of them, my five uncles, uh, my mom's brothers, all of them were in the, in the service. Yeah. And uh, some of them were stationed in, in different places. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we got, uh, I got back and my dad told me whatever I did do was not, not get in the Marine Corps. And he didn't know about it because he didn't, had never served in the military. Yeah. So this guy come out there and has all those guys in the room there in Cincinnati. And, and he said, the Army is getting filled up. He said, somebody's going to have to go in the Marine Corps and uh, some other branch of service. He said, the Army's, 
it's getting filled up. He said, the Army, if you go to the Army, he said, you go up into Fort Meade, Maryland, and freeze your butts off. And uh, he said, if you take the gun with the Marine Corps, you go out over Southern California, that's where you go to. Yeah. I thought to myself, well, I ain't never been to California, I'm going to take this. So <laughs> I'll go back home. My dad said, what'd you do? He said, what'd you, what do you get, the Army and the Marine Corps? I said, I chose the Marine Corps. He said, I knew it. I knew it. You were going to do this. So I said, well, he said, I'd, if I went to Maryland, I'd freeze to that. I said, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I got in the Marine Corps. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I come. I was in an easy company, like a third platoon. And yeah. uh, uh, I had to come our, our turn to go on a little old, uh, we call it a fox hunt, but yeah. uh, had to go out in front of our trench line, part of the trench line. Yeah. And uh, our job was to go up there and get a prisoner. They wouldn't know what was going on. So in going up that hill that night, got all the way to where they were. They were in a, a trench that they had dug. It was when you jumped in there, you had to climb out. It was a, we were we were headed for the top of that that hill, and uh, there was mumbling and all that going up. But we knew they were up there, so we just and go, by the time we got to the top of that hill, uh, uh, they had start shooting at us and, and mortars coming in there and everything else. I got to that trench line, and the lieutenant, our lieutenant, I, me and a boy from, from uh, Ohio, right out of Dayton, mm-hmm. where I lived, mm-hmm. he and I were there together, and that lieutenant come up, and he says, search that trench line out. And I didn't know that I was going to think it was 10 foot deep or whatever what it was. I mean, him sailed off in there, and I had to look straight up there so you see the sky. And I like to never got out of that bun. I turned one way in that trench line, and he turned the other way, and, we, and I emptied that bit in one I had. Because if there's anybody in the way, well, they, they, they were they were they weren't going to hurt me. So, yeah. and some way or another, me and him climbed out of that daggone trench line and got up there. But time, and when I got to the top of the trench line, it felt like somebody just poured warm water all over my. I couldn't see; it was dark, and uh, I couldn't see. That's Bobby's description of being shot in the head while serving in Korea. He'll tell you the rest of the story now, including what his mom and dad were told back home in the States. I didn't know what happened. I mean, it just hit me and and it was it. But the only thing I remember is it just felt like somebody poured some warm water over my head. And, of course, I was out. I don't know. The the battle was over when I come to. I just laid there on the ground right at that trench can. So... When I come to, they wasn't. It was. It was quiet. The battle was over with. Yeah. Not a sign of a sound around or nowhere. Yeah. But you could smell the the smell them before them mortars went off and the rifles and everything. Yeah. And uh, I just I, I don't know. I was I just I I was just I, I was out and I come to, my helmet was gone. I raked my hand over that and, and I thought, boy, it was, it was so cold. I thought, I didn't know why. It looked like somebody threw dirt in my face or something. But I didn't know anything, didn't know nothing. And I thought, boy, I, I remembered how I got up there. So I, I was, thought I had to, I got to get out of here because this ain't my territory. Yeah. So I heard this kid grumbling, uh, moaning down at the hill there. And I go down there and he was one of our guys. And and I couldn't see too good. It was still dark, but just before daylight. It was getting daylight. And I went down and he was holding, I think, one of these hands. I looked and it, it, his hand was gone already. So uh, I said, can you walk? And he, he, and he said, yeah, I think I can. And uh, everybody else is gone, just me and him. Was that I said, we got to get out of here. It's getting daylight. And he got up and he says, I can't walk. I said, you walk or I'll drag you one or two. I said, let's go. And he just... He hobbled along with me, and we got almost got off the top of that hill and run into it where we had stretched, or, they, uh, or us or them, one had her uh, stretched barbed wire, rolls of barbed wire. I mean, it was so, too, so high you couldn't hardly climb over. Run into that, but I didn't see it going up. Didn't know. I was lost then. I didn't know. But the only thing that saved us, those, all the rest of our platoon, there was no sound up there. It was gone. And the only thing that saved us was that, uh, 
the ones that had got hurt or killed, the, 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 our, um, our people knew that, and they got a tank with this big one of them big search lights on it, and they turned that on towards that hill. Wow. The only way I knew how to get out of there yeah. is follow that. I knew where that was at. Yeah. And uh, I kind of, man, I could drug him. I mean, him took all his, it was a long ways. Yeah. Didn't realize it was so far, but. I heard it was so long that your your mom and dad were told you were missing in action. Yeah, they got it. Yeah. Yeah. I got one of the telegrams right up there. It's in that little frame right there. Wow. And, uh, and there you are there. Is that that's you? when they, when they, the telegram they sent to my mom and dad that I was wounded in action. <laughs> I'm Tom Power. This is Toy Hart from The Bluegrass Situation, a podcast about bluegrass. We're remembering the legendary bluegrass musician and singer Bobby Osborne. So uh, one of the Osborne brothers' best love songs, in fact, you know, I remember getting this I don't know, Bluegrass Journey, I think was the name of the DVD I managed to get out in Newfoundland. And I watched the Osborne brothers sing Ruby on stage, and it was like so exciting. It was so punk. I was just absolutely in, in love with it. And I think that's a song that gets a lot of people into the Osborne brothers and even into bluegrass. But not just me, Bob Dylan wrote about the Osborne Brothers' recording of Ruby in his book, Philosophy of Modern Song. He wrote, This song speaks in the mother tongue at breakneck speed, rapid, quickfire, hardcore, and irresistible, close as it comes to alchemy and reckons what it's worth. Right on point, it's keen to drive you mad, and it's all about Ruby, the gal who can restore you whatever you've lost and then make you lose it again. Ruby is just as she is, switched on, plugged in, and ladylike. Yeah, pretty good. What you might not know is the Osbournes learned it from a recording by the great banjo player and folk singer and groundbreaker, Cousin Emmy from Lamb, Kentucky. I asked him a little bit about where he found Ruby and, and how they ended up recording it. Tell me about recording Ruby. What did Cousin Emmy think of you guys doing Ruby? Did you get that from her? She's the only one I ever heard saying it was that old jukebox of my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I heard it start with. And I heard it, it, it went from daylight to dark. She'd call her with the banjo, you know, because yeah. I know you, I've, you've probably read about her, you yeah. know. But her recording of that was on this little, uh, and, and I didn't hide. And I was, my mom's sister lived right up on the hill, and her husband worked in a body shop right, the, in, right where this little restaurant was. And her recording of Ruby went from the time they opened till it quit. Yeah. And she just called him the banjo. And I learned it like that. I never did. Just, just heard it so many times. It went from daylight to dark. And the, and the little street goes up to where they live. It's still right there today. And that corner where that little restaurant was is still, still there today. Right. But that her recording of Ruby was on that jukebox. When did you guys decide to do How did you end up doing that one? Well, to, 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 that, at the end of that little story there is um, I, I, when I, I learned Ruby, but I never thought about it no more in my life. It just, yeah. it just left my memory. Yeah. But I hadn't, I'd heard it so many times. I just, I learned the words to it, but just listened to her sing it so many times through the daytime. So that, that uh, kind of ended that right there. And I never thought about Ruby anymore. Not a thing about it until uh, I got back out of the Marine Corps yeah. and me and Sonny got together. And there was a DJ in Dayton, Ohio, his name was Tommy Sutton. We knew and we knew him. And we'd been trying to play, you know, and we had a had a boy from uh, Morristown, Tennessee, Enos Johnson. And he was friends with Jimmy Martin because Jimmy was from the same area. So uh, we got him to sing with us. Red Allen, he was uh, had his own group. In another club downtown, and we was playing a nightclub, yeah. and they heard they they wanted us to come down there and play. And we was, we was going to get uh, the time Jimmy Martin had left the picture, but then he'd been gone. Uh, there's another boy there from East Tennessee, Enos Johnson was his name. We thought we'd just get him and us two to go down there and play that little club. Well, he says, boy, he says I'd like to go. He says I don't use alcohol, and I don't want to be around where it's at. Yeah. He would have fit us good. He worked. He worked a little bit with us, and uh, we never had nobody. So me and Sonny was going to go down there, and Sonny had heard of Red Island somewhere along the line. Yeah. 
And he said, I might get him to, to sing with us. So Sonny called him and he says, yeah, I'll do that. So that's how we got together. It started out in that little nightclub in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. And we got, to, we, and Red was a tenor singer when he came with us. Yeah. So he was going to sing a tenor, and I says, no, I, 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 that's that's the part I'm going to do. He said, well, buddy, I can sing as high as you do. I said, it don't make no difference. I said, you ain't going to beat me. I don't care what you do. So I'd heard him sing, but his voice was, it wasn't like mine. And we got, we got, we talked him into coming in and, and playing with us. He did, he did. And he wanted to get me into a contest so bad. To see who could sing higher. Yeah. Yeah. Because he thought he could sing higher than me. Yeah. And uh, we was in that little nightclub playing right there, you know. He was on the stage that night, and he says, I can sing higher than you can. Let me sing the tenor. I says, no, I don't believe that. You can't. He said, well, let's prove it. I mean, there's people sitting out there drinking right then. You know, they didn't know what we was talking about. So we started singing Ruby. Yeah. Started out in C, you know. And uh, I did I do part of it in Red. He come and do, do, sing the same thing, you know. Just, and all these people sitting out there at that time, they quit drinking. They were just sitting there like this watching us have a contest right there, you know. Finally, but we moved it up to Fred or two, I think. If I, I might have been from C. <laughs> we moved it up to D or somewhere there. Yeah. And it got to that one part of the highest part. And Red couldn't, he couldn't. And every which one could sing the highest was the one that was going to do the high part. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got down to the key of D. And when it hit that highest part on it, he couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So I got the job of singing the high part. <laughs> but he was a tenor singer before he came with, so he knew the tenor part. Yeah. So all he did was just drop down to the lowest part there, yeah. the third part, and it was just perfect harmony. Well, that's the Osborne Brothers' great innovation. Yeah. You were the first band to have the lead vocal be the highest vocal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a I knew the t he knew the tenor, but but he couldn't sing it as high as I did. Yeah. And that's why he had to go to the low tenor if he worked with us. A lot of people do that now because of you guys. Oh, it's still going thing now. Yeah, you know, yeah. People doing it. Yeah. You know, Sonny it. sang baritone, right? Yeah, Sonny sang a third part, which is baritone. Yeah. And it was a, the time I did the tenor way up there, his, uh, the baritone was it was the easiest thing there was. To sing. <laughs> uh, if you sing with Monroe, you'd have to come down a lot lower with the baritone part, you know. So I think maybe in 2023, we're finally past the conversations around electric instruments in, in bluegrass music. I mean, if you look at the success of Billy Strings and I mean, Alison Krauss to that point, it, you feel like the number of people who are going to say like, oh, you shouldn't use electric bass or you shouldn't plug in your instruments. There's almost, there's very, very few of them anymore. But it was pretty scandalous at the time that the Osborne brothers started to use pickups on their instruments. I mean, kind of not many people were doing it at that point. I asked him a little bit about that decision. So, boy, I wonder i tell you where we was at the first time we ever tried that. It was in uh, playing a nightclub in Wisconsin. And we was playing right into mics. Everybody had a mic. But this club, everybody back there drinking and talking and hollering and all that, they didn't know you. Never, they had never heard a thing we was doing. I mean, they just... And I already, we had the idea of that. And I had the mic in the mantle, and Sonny had fixed a rig on his banjo to do that. The boy playing the guitar, uh, the guitar was slid out anyway. He had one of them good Martin guitars. And uh, people in that nightclub, they just sat there and just sit and read the paper while we was on, you know. <laughs> so, and the, our agency was the Wilbur Brothers had that Wilhelm agency downtown. Mm -hmm. And they, they had booked us in that club for a week, which was good work. It didn't have to go over, just go out the next night and play. And there was a little music store right across the street. And I looked over there and I saw that music store. I said, you know, I thought about that little microphone. I said, and we, these these guys that played there, they had these amps this high, them big, they had all kinds of amps. And I thought, Sonny said, we all just said, ain't nobody listening to us, what we do anyway. I said, and we went over to that store, and and I bought that uh, wire, mm -hmm. it's just a wire, but yeah, in the yeah. mantle, yeah, just a little small wire. Mm -hmm. and we plugged them in, and <laughs> we went on the stage that second or third night at that club. Mm -hmm. And when them, them people, I mean, they might be half drunk and everything else, but when they heard what we were doing, mm -hmm. 
peeling the paint right off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> they, had to, they had to listen to it. <laughs> that's where. That's where. That's the first place we ever hooked them up at, right there. Yeah. But we learned right there. I remember playing the crowds at Boom Blossom. Mm -hmm. People sitting so far back, even with the sound system going, they couldn't tell what you were doing. Yeah. But that solved that problem right there. You know, I'm always curious about how Bill Monroe feels about stuff like that, like anything that changed or modernized the music, because I find him so unpredictable. Like everything you expect him to hate, he might love, and everything you expect him to love, he might hate. So I asked Bobby a bit about what Bill thought. Uh, I, took, I went to in Ryman Auditorium. I had to pick up on that man. And Sonny didn't need one, but the banjo with the mic too. Yeah. He'd, well, he'd, I went to the engineer upstairs, and I said, can you fix the boy before you can put, use that mic? He said, I'll run, I'll run you a cord and you, that you could plug right, plug your, right into it, and you'll run right to the house. And he fixed it up to me, and was on my old show that night. Yeah. And boy, we played, I think we did Fireball Mail, but I, I took a break out on it. I just cracked it up. Man, I was just peeling a paint right off the back end of that rhyming old tour. <laughs> <laughs> Monroe, uh, he, was, he was just like this right here. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on. And so the banjo was loud enough anyway. Yeah. But the band, I never could get it before everybody could hear it. Boy, when I I took that break of a fireball mail, and it, it, just, uh, it went all over that building. Mm -hmm. And so we... He was he was emceeing the show. It was his show that we was on. And uh, when I left the stage, he said, uh, "You wait a minute, boy. I want to talk to you right here." I didn't know what that was going to be like, so I waited on him. And he 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 come back and he said, uh, "What kind of middle you got, boy?" I said, "It's just like yours." Oh no, well no, uh -uh. it ain't like mine. He said, "Mine don't sound like that." I said, "What if you put a put a pickup on?" He said, uh, "What's that?" <laughs> I said. Bill, I said, how do you think them people out there hear you? Oh, uh, they got good ears. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, well, I said you couldn't. Have you ever been to Bean Blossom and go to the back end and, yeah. to, to the, and try to hear what they're doing up on the stage? Mm. Uh, no, I ain't never tried that. <laughs> I said, you try it sometime. You ain't hear what's going up on the stage. Mm -hmm. I said, when I put a pickup on the mantle, they're going to hear it from the back road to the hillside yeah, back there. Yeah, And he said, I don't like that electric stuff. And I said, well, <laughs> what you're saying over is electricity. Runs that. I said, take it away from me. Six rows back there as loud as they'll hear it. <laughs> so he, I never heard anything much out of him anymore. He said, I don't like that electric stuff. That he electric called it that until you. Okay, so this part with Bobby, I'm sort of uh, uh, obsessed with bluegrass lore. Like, I, I, I'm obsessed with the stories bluegrass musicians tell one another, like in the night times, about these icons and the actual wild things they did. I've always been of a certain belief that bluegrass, especially early bluegrass, the things they needed to do to survive and build a career outside of mainstream country in the 50s and 60s, was way more punk, way more DIY than any hardcore band touring from the 80s. I had heard this incredibly punk rock story about the Osbournes, about the time Sonny and Bobby and the band showed up to a gig and the venue was closed. And, well, what they did next, I, I had to ask him about it. I heard a story one time. I want to, uh, you, You've been great. I, I got a couple more stories I want to get from you. You, you, you. I heard a story about the Osborne brothers one time that I wanted to ask you about. And... The story as I heard it was you you and Sonny and the band showed up at a, a gig for a, a concert and the venue, the place you were playing the concert was closed and there was no one there to let you in. And then you guys got in there yourselves and ran the concert. Does that ring a bell to you? Yeah. It happened in Canada. Really? <laughs> <laughs> we were, before, it was before the Osborne Brothers was ever thought about. Yeah. He and I were working with uh, another popular group from Knoxville, Tennessee, the Bailey Brothers. Yeah. Okay, we were working with Charlie Bailey. Well, he he worked. I mean, he knew what Canada was like. I'd never been to Canada. Yeah. And uh, he had a date way up in Canada somewhere, and we got to the place, and there was snow about a foot on the <laughs> snow on the ground, and it was just like a school building or something. I had windows all around the place, and uh, we got there and. I mean, and we was at Wheeling, West Virginia, working with him. We got to that place that night. There wasn't a soul showed up, and nobody ever showed up. 
No, I think there was, I, I believe it was four or five people mm -hmm. there was trying to get in. Nobody could get in that daggone place. The people it, uh, was going to unlock the door for putting him in there. <laughs> and one of these guys, or, 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 he said, well, I don't know how to get in. If you guys want to play, with and get, we'll get in for it's warm. Man, the snow was, it was <laughs> six inches deep out on the ground right there. And we got in and went in through the window, and went in there and set up and sung to these four or five people. And... uh he said, well, how much you owe I, I, We just told him, I mean, if you come out and wear the like we just we don't charge you nothing. And we got in a car, and it was in Charlie Bailey's car, I guess. <laughs> and so uh, we just got in a car, and that was it. We just we just going home, coming home for Christmas anyway. <laughs> and so that's how that that's how that happened right there. But we, we, we got in that school and played four or five songs for those 10 people maybe or something like that. And we played for them, and... Never charged him a penny, just was got, went, got our car and went back home. So there was so much that I didn't get a chance to talk to Bobby about. The Osbournes being the first bluegrass band to bring their music to college campuses, playing at the White House, continuing to play music after his brother Sonny retired, more Bill Monroe stories. But I knew we were running out of time, and come on, the guy was in his 90s. So I figured with the time I had, I wanted to ask him about the song that they recorded it's not just one of the most popular bluegrass songs. It's not just like a gateway song to get people into the music. It's one of Tennessee's state songs. It's a song sung at college football games, I think by the University of Tennessee. I'm not 100% on that as I'm from Canada and we don't really do college football, but I'd like to learn. Um, I had to ask Bobby Osborne about how the Osborne brothers ended up recording Rocky Top. Wish that I was on old Rocky Top down in the Tennessee hills. Ain't no smile. So I, I got a couple more stories I want to get out of you. Can you tell me the story of how Rocky Top came to the band? Yeah, we were we were in Nashville, of course, by that time, and we got a we worked through Acuff Rose, first part of our recording career, and in the meantime, Boudelo and Felice Bryant were songwriters and wrote some of the greatest songs that's ever been put together of all time. Of, of anybody, that's just true. We got together and they lived just. We lived in Hendersonville at the time, and they just they lived just across the way from us, and we got acquainted with them through Acuff Rose. Mm -hmm. They were uh, writing for Acuff Rose, mm -hmm. and they had that time there had they had written all them songs for the Everly Brothers mm -hmm. and the, uh, dream, dream. any all people dream, from the yeah. opera had recorded their songs. Yeah, we knew them. We did some, on a recording session somewhere. We picked out some of the, a couple of their songs and did them. We got acquainted with them like that, too. Come to find out, they just lived a little ways from us. Both of us lived in Hendersonville at the time. And uh, Sonny had went over there one day, and we had, Real Muddy River was out at yeah. that time. We went, Sonny one day had went over to his house looking for some songs. And uh, he called, Sonny called me up, and he said, he's got a song here he's working on. He said, y'all come over here and let's listen to it. He said, we might, could, we might could do it. So I got my car and went over there and sat and he was, he was probably about halfway through, through writing, writing Rocket Top, trying to put it together. So Felice, his, uh, his wife, she, uh, she helped him quite a bit in that songwriting. Both of them were great people, great writers. And uh, he, was, he had Rocket Top out trying to write it then. He had a verse or two of it. But he had the, the melody to it and everything. He just, he's working on them lyrics. And, oh, he was saying, this, a slow beat on the guitar. He was saying like that. I got to think about Road Muddy River. I said, you know, if we could we'd, if we could speed that up, it'd be like Road Muddy River, but a, a, a different song. Yeah. And, of course, they said, well, if you got if you got a better melody to tell you what we got, that's fine. Yeah. So we told him uh, it just sounded like it, 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 speed that up, boy. It, it just fit perfect. Yeah. So uh, we we told him he says, "Well, just go ahead and finish it." And we had a record set of all things. We had a recording session coming up in three days. Yeah. And uh, we said, "Just finish finish that up, and we might we play it like we do Roll Muddy River." And he'd make a good song. Mm -hmm. Well, they finished it, and we went over there and got it and took it to the 
we looked over the words to it, or I did, and we took it out to the station. We waited, and the Wilbur Brothers, because they had this big publishing company, and they wanted us to do songs through their company. But Boodle and Felice Brown had their company going. And of course, they were going to publish it, mm -hmm. so we we waited till the last song was going to be done. We drove out Rocky Top, and Owen Bradley was in, in, I mean, the main guy at, at Decca Records. He was in there, you know, at the, he was an engineer that day, along with an engineer. So Teddy Wilburn was there, one of the Wilburn brothers. And we started singing Rocket Top. And Teddy come out and he said, what's this? I said, that's a song that Boodle and Felice Bryant wrote. He said, we, we wanted to record it. He said, well, we, we always wanted you to do the Sheer Fire song, our publishing company. And I said, well, Boodle, I said, we've recorded some of his songs before, and he had that, and we thought we'd just, we already messed with it. We knew we could do it, you know. And uh, he says, well, he says, we 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 really, we like B Boodle and Felice Brown. He said, they're they're good friends here. I said, so just go ahead and do it. So that'd be fine. So we got to record Rocket Top like that. What a big song. I mean. Since, uh, well, long before Sonny quit, we did it a lot at the Opry. Yeah. Everywhere we went. We closed the show with Rocky Top. You used to close it with Ruby all the time. Yeah. But Rocky Top, I mean, everybody wanted to hear that. And we've even got about halfway through the show with people out in the audience. Don't, don't, don't leave her to play Rocky Top. We don't hear that. It's just <laughs> on and on. And we just got to thinking, man, that, that's got to be on every show. Yeah. And uh, Sonny's uh, passed away recently, but we, 20 years ago, no, it's been longer than that now. <laughs> 30 years ago would have been when yeah, somebody left, yeah. Uh, I just come to the conclusion, he, he didn't want to sing the same songs twice. We go to opera every once in a while and sing it, you know, we get a get applause, it's just good. Yeah. And so, but when Sonny decided he wanted to retire, I just, I, I, th I thought to myself, it's my deal now, I guess. So I've never been on that stage anymore down there. And they have me to the opera. Rocky Top is, is <laughs> if I sing one, I'm going to do Rocky Top. <laughs> And that is it for Toy Heart. I'm so grateful to Bobby Osborne for the opportunity to talk to him about his life and his work. I'm especially grateful now that he's passed on to have spent that time with him. I want to thank Bobby's family, in particular his son Boge, for being so generous and letting us into the house and spending time with us as well. This is sort of, I guess, the launch of season two of Toy Heart. Uh, long awaited, I know, and I appreciate the emails and messages. I saw a Reddit thread the other day. It was like, oh, I really like Toy Heart. It's too bad it's over, which tells me we've waited too long to launch the second season. So yeah, the second season is coming very soon. You're going to hear conversations with Sam Bush, Alison Krauss, Larry Sparks, uh, Jody Stecker, Mike Compton, so many more. If you're not already subscribed to this podcast, uh, do so and the podcast will arrive on your feed. Toy Heart is produced by Stephanie Coleman and me, Tom Power. Our executive producer is Amy Reitenauer Jacobs with help as always from the entire BGS team. You can discover more at thebluegrasssituation.com. This show was mixed and edited by Chris Jacobs. Our theme song is Toy Heart by Bill Monroe, performed by Chris Eldridge and Kristen Andreasen. See you soon. Thanks, Bobby. Later on. Rocky Top, Tennessee.